All right, okay. Maddie, please. Oh, great. I'll just share my screen here. One moment. Um, okay. All right. And can everyone see that? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Awesome, all right. So just before I jump into my presentation of jazz dance, um, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So my name is Maddie Font and I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Can Canada, I'm situated on Treaty 7 territory. Uh, I'm a third year uh, student at the University of Calgary studying dance and social and cultural anthropology. Uh, I'm an inspiring, aspiring dance artist, choreographer, and future anthropologist. Um, and I have an extensive background playing jazz music, actually, so um, drums and singing in that, and as well as dance, um, as I've been dancing since I was eight years old. Um, so I've been very artistic my whole life. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pull this up here. There. Um, very artistic, um, and I've always been involved with music and dance. Um, and I did dance outside of my studies at school at a recreational dance studio um, since I was eight years old up until high school, which is grade 12 or class 12. Um, and then I decided I wanted to pursue a uh, dance in my post-secondary. So um, I also have a special interest in dance film as well as of recently. So kind of exploring how cultural and anthropology and dance kind of situate themselves and how they relate. Um, and my main area, like area of interest right now is jazz dance. Um, I'm obviously still a student in this uh, topic. So what I've learned and what I'm presenting on today is a work in progress. And it's what I've learned from um, my mentors and professionals in the field right now. Um, so I've just included a couple or a few pictures here of just some projects I've been involved with. Um, the first one at the top there was a school presentation I was in. Um, and then the middle one there, I actually used to perform at an amusement park <laughs> throughout high school um, here in Calgary. And then the bottom one there is another um, photo from a school performance as well. And so every year I do around probably three or four performances um, within my school year as part of my, like I get, I get graded on them um, for participation and things like that. So that's just a little bit about me. So. Without further ado, I'm going to be presenting on the topic of uh, jazz dance today. And so I first wanted to just kind of, before I jump into this topic, I want to acknowledge that I am a guest to this um, area of study of jazz dance. And I just wanted to read this statement here just to let you know um, about my position when talking about jazz dance, as it does have a, a very heavy history. Um, so I, Maddie Font, recognize myself as a guest um, Sorry, I'm just going to move this. That was a guest from to the forum that was born out of Black American culture and the African American experience. I recognize my white privilege when confronting topics related to Black American culture and the African American experience, and only hope to learn, educate, and share this beautiful art form with others, as it is a big part of my existence on this earth. I intend on sharing my passion for dance by gathering information from my Black mentors and teachers. Jazz dance and jazz music has made me who I am today. And I owe it all to Black culture and the African American experience. Um, so, for, you'll, this will start to kind of make sense as I go along and explain the history um, of where jazz dance has come from. So, I'll just go to the next slide here. And so, what we will be kind of um, covering today is what is jazz dance? Where does it originate from? Um, what is the jazz dance tree of styles and genres? That will make more sense as we um, go along as well. Um, African aesthetic and cultural appropriation, and then to end off a summary and questions if you guys have any. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop me as well or put them in the chat or anything like that. Um, so to move on to what is jazz dance? Um, well, jazz dance has multiple meanings and styles and expressions um, that have evolved over the years. Um, so it's pretty, it's a pretty complex um, topic, I would say. It's pretty hard to nail down one specific definition as it really does come from a lot of different positions. Um, and so it's made up of a lot of different styles and meanings. Um, there are many different definitions. Um, therefore, it's, it makes it hard to pinpoint one exactly. Um, but 
to kind of summarize it and to begin the conversation, the roots of jazz dance are African, particularly West African. Um, and I'll go on a little bit more about the, the history um, in the next slide here, but um, it was born out of the transatlantic slave trade um, from Africa. And so this is kind of where it was started. Um, so enslavement played a huge role in the creation of jazz dance. And so we'll discuss that in the next slide here. Um, but during the time of slavery, African dance evolved into African American dance, um, which was very much influenced by the mixing of different African tribes, cultures and religions and restrictions imposed on slaves within the plantations in the US when this was all going on. Um, so with these factors at play, this created the jazz age. Um, so this was kind of an era that started at, at the beginning of the 1900s. And so at the beginning of the jazz age, um, a form of jazz dance called vernacular jazz dance was born out of this time. Um, and so vernacular jazz is kind of the original, if you want to think about it. Um, you have like the original vernacular jazz dance style. And before that, you have the African roots. And so you have African roots that have now kind of formed into this vernacular style, they call it, um, which was born out of uh, the slave trade in America. Um, so yeah, for, within vernacular jazz, it's composed of mainly two forms of jazz dance. Um, this will also become more clear in a couple slides here, but they are called the Lindy Hop and the Charleston. And so these are two forms that emerged out of um, vernacular jazz. Um, through the experiences of um, African people, they came over and had to go through a bunch of change, um, hardship. And these are the kind of forms that emerged out of their experiences through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so, yeah, the Lindy Hop and the Charleston were, were and they are still considered a social dance. So meaning you're dancing with other people, it's a social interaction. Um, and they were practiced in mainly jazz clubs and dance halls during the 1920s and 30s. And so all of this will kind of start to make sense as I go to the next slide here, but this is just kind of a very broad um, general overview to get started. Um, so kind of going back to uh, the origins of dan jazz dance, so the transatlantic slave trade. Um, here I have a picture on the left that kind of just describes um, the flow of what this looked like. So. Europeans were <clears throat> coming over to Africa, <laughs> excuse me, and um, distributing goods and African slaves, unfortunately. And um, you can see uh, kind of the arrows of where the slaves were taken. So they first were taken to the Caribbean islands. And then in the purple here, you can see that they were kind of transported to the North America, um, mainly in the United States. And so um, this occurred between the 16th and 19th centuries. Um, more towards 19th century for the um, um, slaves, um, but Europeans created this uh, to transport goods and African slaves to the Americas for profit. Um, incredibly inhumane and damaging to African peoples, um, and jazz dance and jazz music was born out of this slave experience in the United States and was used and created as a way to resist and survive um, in their experience. So on the bottom left here, I just have a graphic of what it may have looked like on plantations where um, African peoples were taken to um, do work. And then on the right here, um, this is actually a graphic taken from, um, I believe um, it's a form of dance and music called ring, the ring shout. And it was a form that emerged out of the slave trade as a way to kind of gather without being punished um, for practicing their, their culture. So they found a way around um, the rules that were set upon them by um, American um, um, people. So they, they created ways to express themselves through music and through dance. And this is kind of how jazz was formed um, because they weren't allowed to speak their language. Um, they weren't allowed to practice their um, cultures from Africa. They completely had to um, totally readjust and figure out a way to get through and survive these um, terrible times. So they use music to be able to communicate specifically actually when they were um, working in some instances, they would have work songs that they would sing to each other to communicate. And this wasn't deemed um, 
like this wasn't deemed to be bad or they weren't punished all the time for doing this. Um, so they found a way around it. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a general overview, but jazz dance and jazz music was born out of this experience because this was the, a way to um, express themselves. And if you listen to a lot of jazz music um, from the very early um, period, you'll hear that kind of heaviness in the songs and the lyrics. Um, so I have, I've included a playlist later on in the presentation you can check out as well that has some songs in there. But this is the origins of jazz dance. And so keep this in mind when we kind of get to the end of the presentation um, and it'll start to make a little bit more sense, I think, um, to be able to compare. Maddie, I think uh, uh, Nafi has a question. Oh yeah, for sure, go ahead. Is it in the so, chat or? Uh, no, not. An example of jazz, jazz music. An example of jazz music. What's an example of jazz music? Is that what I heard? Um, so I can actually, I will, I can pop up a, a video afterwards. Um, yeah, yeah that, but, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, I think the flow is going just perfect. I think later okay, we'll see examples. Good. For sure. Yeah, I have um, some links posted at the end with some jazz music that we okay. can listen to after. Okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, moving on to the jazz dance tree. So this is a graphic from a textbook that I have. Um, and I think it just really nicely demonstrates all the various different forms and genres that have kind of come out of Africa and the African experience. Um, and so as you can see here, this is a tree. And so the bottom, we have roots here and it's all saying African dance, African, African. And so that's just demonstrating that it's really birthed out of Africa. And then the European influence comes along through the transatlantic slave trade um, and really influences how um, African people are living their lives and conducting their lives in um, through this experience. And this is where the vernacular jazz dance comes into play, um, like I was mentioning before. So the vernacular jazz um, composing again of the Lindy Hop and the Charleston. And these are two kind of different dances that you would perform that have come out these two styles through the vernacular jazz dance. Um, and as you can see, vernacular is this whole tree trunk here. So this is really the main pillar that has influenced all of these other branches that are coming out here. And so the main steps and the characteristics of jazz movement um, all comes back to the all comes back to the vernacular. Um, and I should add the different kind of characteristics of vernacular jazz dance um, look, look different in the body. So the way that the body will look like when you're performing a vernacular jazz dance movement is that you're very grounded, your knees are bent, your hips are bent, um, you're connected to the ground and to the earth. And it's also a very social um, dance. You're, you're dancing with people, you're connecting with people. Um, and it, there's not much competition and you're just enjoying yourself. And so this is kind of the essence of vernacular jazz dance um, and some of the characteristics of what you would perform. And so- M Maddie, can I ask a quick question? For sure. So when you say vernacular, right? So in our everyday language, when we use the word vernacular, we think it's a sort of uh, different dialect of a language or a particular ways of talking, a particular discourse. What exactly yeah. do you mean by vernacular uh, jazz here? Yeah, definitely. So vernacular, I would say, is an original form, something that is always kind of consistent. So vernacular jazz, meaning um, when you see someone that is dancing in a vernacular way, you can recognize that that's what it is um, mm -hmm. because you're noticing, OK, they have bent knees, they're, they're connected to the ground, um, they're, they're, they're relaxed throughout their body. Um, so this is kind of a dance form that you can identify easily across the board if you're, if you're familiar with jazz dance. And it's, it's what's influenced and um, set, set up these other um, styles of dance. So um, for instance, how can I, yeah. So for instance, um, vernacular jazz could influence tap dance right here in that in tap dance, you'd always, you would also have bent knees and you'd also be low to the ground. And so you'd have vernacular characteristics um, be popping up in these other um, dance forms here. 
So this whole um, trunk here has influenced all of these um, branches of jazz dance. And so each one of these branches is kind of a genre or a different style that has been um, influenced or born out of vernacular dance. And they all also correlate to a different era as well as, as well it correlates to different um, kind of social movements as well that have been born out of that. Um, tap dance, for instance, um, was very influenced by Irish immigrants coming over to New York as well. And it was also influenced by um, African people coming over. So there's just different things all coming together. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation, jazz dance has many different um, definitions and expressions. So it's very hard to kind of pinpoint one specific thing, but just to keep it simple, like vernacular is the baseline for all of these branches. So it influences all of these styles and each of one of these branches, you could probably spend an, like hours explaining. So I've decided to kind of really talk about vernacular jazz at, as it is the foundation. Um, African dance is also, African dance is the main foundation and then you have vernacular dance that's formed out of that. Um, so I'm choosing to kind of focus on vernacular dance and then if you go all the way up to the left here, I'm gonna also focus on pop jazz. Um, just because it is so, it is very current right now um, and it has evolved a ton and you'll see it is way different than what vernacular jazz is. Um, so we'll kind of get into that now, but just so you know, the jazz has many different styles um, and different things that have influenced the styles have made them what they are. So tap dance is what it is because of Irish immigrants coming over and the African aesthetic coming together. And hip hop is what it is due to, um, let's say social movements happening in the nineties. So just different, different things coming out of this. So just keep this in mind as a little bit of a graphic, but the main point here is that vernacular jazz dance and pop jazz are very far from one another. And that'll be evident when you watch the difference between the two. Um, so we'll move on to the next here. So taking that idea of the vernacular, let's move this here. Um, the, so vernacular right here and pop jazz. So remembering that these are two very far um, genres from one another on the, on the tree. Um, so talking about um, pop jazz. So this is very current um, jazz dance that's being practiced today. And um, it is it is strayed very far from the original vernacular form. And you can tell this, um, especially by watching someone dance, but through these videos, you can tell that they have very long extensions. They're not very close to the ground. Um, they're not very grounded per se. It's very, it's very for the purpose of entertainment and less for the connection between people and um, paying respect, I guess, to the true form of vernacular jazz. It's still a valid form, um, but it is troublesome at times or problematic at times as well. And I'll get more into that in a minute. Um, and then you have non-commercialized vernacular dance, which is what we were talking about, the foundation that has come from African dance and from Africa. And it is true to the African aesthetic. And so I'll mention African aesthetic a lot throughout this presentation. And basically it's just meaning you can identify that the dance movement has originated from Africa, that it's from a traditional African dances. Um, and so in these pictures, you can tell they're low to the ground, they're socializing. Um, it's not so rigid or um, has to be uniform like this picture over here to the left. Um, so it's very much, a community based form where you're dancing with people, um, a social form, whereas this commercialized pop jazz that's now being practiced today is it's individualistic. Um, and it's very much you're all also trying to be the same at the same time. Um, so sometimes you will have solo numbers like this, just one person um, dancing. And then sometimes you'll have um, a group of people who are all trying to look the same, be the same. And there's not really any room for um, expression or personal expression. And so 
these two forms, um, they contradict each other a lot because um, they, one of them is very true to the original vernacular form because it, it is that, right? But, and then pop jazz is so far removed. So we'll get into that a little bit here. Um, but yeah, so we're just comparing and seeing kind of the differences between the two. Um, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit more in the next slides. But I don't know if this video will come through for you guys, but um, here I just have an example of what commercialized pop jazz or competitive jazz dance looks like. And one thing to add to this is the competitive aspect of this. Um, so right now, currently, if you're a dancer, you can either dance competitively in North America at least, um, or recreationally. I danced rec recreationally, I didn't do comp competition, but a lot of the time comp competition dance is very motivated by um, money, obviously, and kind of, um, what's the word, um, almost selling, selling dances and selling classes to children so that they can make more money. Because to be able to be in a competitive dance class, you have to be enrolled in many different classes um, to be worthy enough of doing a competition. So this is kind of where pop jazz has gone because it's catering to this competitive jazz dance. And so you'll see in the video, um, a lot of their movement is very removed from the vernacular form. Um, you will see bent knees and things like that, but it's not the same in that they're not totally grounded and they're, they're not connecting to the earth and to each other. Um, and it's very much for the purposes of entertainment and com competition between each other. So I'll just play a little bit here. I won't play the whole thing um, as it is pretty long, but just to give you guys an idea. So again, very uniform here. I don't know if you could see much of that, but it was mostly comprising of tricks as well. So with the competition in dance right now, a lot of it is having to do with who can do the most tricks, who can show off the most, um, how are we going to entertain the most. Um, there's also some hyper sexualization in there, um, which is also very toxic for children. So just um, competitive dance can be very problematic. I'm not saying that the that pop jazz isn't a valid form. I think it definitely still can be in the right setting. Um, but just to give you an example of how far um, pop jazz has gone from the original roots of African dance and vernacular dance is quite, it's, it's, it's crazy. So um, that's just to give you a little example. Another thing I wanna point out is that the music isn't authentic jazz music that is kind of the music that was playing was kind of everyday pop music that you would hear. And so it's also not respecting or paying tribute to original jazz um, music. Um, so that's just to give you an example of what commercialized pop jazz looks like. Um, in the next slide, I will show you what vernacular jazz looks like. And this is again, the, um, the baseline, the original, form of jazz, which has influenced all these other genres. And so there are two different um, styles, the Lindy Hop and the Charleston. Um, in this video, I'm showing you the Lindy Hop um, and it's just a style of vernacular dance. Um, and so, yes, I'll show you, this is from a movie, um, but it'll just give you a good idea. Um, some things you can look for are the bent knees, the connection with one another, um, the connection to earth um, and just things like that. So just see if you can kind of pinpoint or pick out those um, kind of African aesthetics within the movement as well. 
And I'm just gonna forward a little bit because the dancing starts a bit later. Um, here we go. Of the now. just an example of where you're gonna where you're seeing the African aesthetic come through where you're seeing those original um, movements um, come through of the bent knees uh, the relaxed shoulders the connection with one another and you might say like that looked pretty acrobatic too like there were some tricks in there and things like that um, but it the the context isn't the same they're doing that to have fun with each other and to connect with each other and those movements have been um, kind of born out of the, the African-American experience. So those are original, true um, dance movements to keep in mind. Um, so it is unfortunately a dying art form that is highly unrepresented in today's dance world. And this is why I, I'm so passionate about talking about this is because um, this history about jazz dance is getting lost and it's not um, being appreciated or um, incorporated in today's dance um, performances and dance classes um, like it should be to preserve the art form. So um, just moving on to the next um, slide, I'm just going to talk about the African aesthetic within jazz dance and how cultural appropriation can come into play with that. And so um, for those who, who may not know, cultural appropriation um, is when a culture isn't appreciated or it is taken without permission and it is modified or someone profits off of it and doesn't properly um, doesn't properly represent it or um, pay respects to where it's um, needed. So this can often happen in jazz dance, um, as you can see, because when you start out with a vernacular um, dance form, and it's morphed and changed so much to be like pop jazz, you can see the disconnect between the two and you can see um, kind of the disregard for the history that's gone through time. Um, and so where you can kind of run into issues with this in the dance world and where I've seen it is um, dance teachers providing jazz classes, but not doing their not doing their research in trying to understand the history of jazz dance, and then they're taking their classes um, and giving them labels that aren't necessarily correct um, or authentic, and then they're profiting off of those because they're making money, and people don't know better because they're not educated in what the true form of jazz dance really is, and so it's important to acknowledge the connection between the dances of traditional African cultures and the history of jazz dances of Black Americans, because that's where it's originated from, right? Um, and many don't acknowledge this, or they're, or they're un, un, uneducated about the connection. So this can lead to cultural appropriation, whether it's intended or not. Um, and you can find that also in the movement. So someone can take a movement, um, let's say, of an African dance, um, a specific African dance movement, um, and then put a completely different label on it, and then kind of claim it as their own. And so then they go, let's say, and they perform this movement and they make profit off of this. And so that can run into issues, right? Sorry, Rusha, did you have a question? Sorry, by movement, yeah. are you talking about like movement, kind of like dance moves? Yes, sorry. So yeah, physical okay. movement. So let's say like this, something is a traditional African movement. If someone takes this same movement, um, makes a dance piece with it, um, sells tickets, people buy the tickets, then they're making a profit off of something that's not, it's not appropriate, it's not theirs to do that. Um, or if they wanted to do it properly, they, they definitely still could, um, but they would have to put the time into understanding the history and acknowledging um, the history with it. 
And so this is a huge issue in the field of dance. Um, and it also Maddie, could I, sorry, yeah. Maddie, could I add something, uh, another example, uh, just to contextualize sure. for many of the students here. So yeah. for instance, the, uh, the yoga mm -hmm. has yeah. emerged out of South exactly. Asia and it's 5,000 years of Vedic philosophy and in all of that. And yoga is not essentially something that can is confined within the body of you know, people's exercise. You know, the, so it's not about how flexible you can be only, it's much mm -hmm. more than that. But when it is sold in the Western world, oh, if you do yoga, then you will uh, attain certain desired body shape and therefore, you know, here is $5,000 and you know, but the original evolution of yoga had nothing to do with capitalist co-option at all whatsoever. Yeah. No, that's a great example. That's exactly yeah, what I'm talking here. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a huge issue in the field of dance. Um, and not only within dance, but it's also just important that the general population knows this as well in case you decide to go take a jazz dance class or you enroll your children in jazz dance classes or you go see a performance. It's just important to understand um, understand the history and what's authentic before you go and spend your money on these things or participate in these things or put times towards them. So those are just some of the ethical and economic implications of this. Um, but as you can see, these top two pictures here are um, traditional African dances, and obviously the one on the bottom isn't, but you can tell the, the vast difference between the two, and these are apparently still called both jazz dance. I mean, these two are African dances, but African roots have, you know, influenced jazz dance, um, and so it's just interesting, I find, to see how far removed this pop jazz and commercialized jazz dance has come um, and how blind people are to the fact that there is a huge history behind it. And it is very important that you understand it before you do participate in it. Um, so yeah, that is that um, slide. I have a quick summary here just to kind of um, go over what we've talked about and then we can head into questions if anybody has any, but um, so jazz dance is rooted obviously in the African aesthetic, it was born out of Africa. Um, jazz dance was born out of the transatlantic slave trade. There are many genres like we saw on the tree, uh, many different ways that you can classify jazz dance. Uh, as jazz dance evolves throughout time, we need to be aware of cultural appropriation and educating ourselves on these topics before we participate in them. Um, and the conservation of vernacular jazz, so the original form of jazz dance, is crucial in maintaining an accurate historical dialogue and maintaining um, the history behind this. So that's my presentation for all of that. And if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, and we can also listen to some jazz music too here in a second. So yeah, if you just, you can unmute or put it in the chat if you have any questions. I think, I think, you know, some of them, they have questions, you know, they can, uh, maybe if you stop sharing the screen now, sure. they'll be able to see all of, all of them together. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. There so, you go. So, yeah, I think, I okay. think uh, Nafi had question, then Novo had question. I think many of them have questions. So, Nafi, what was the question you wanted to ask? I wanted to ask the question that she answered. Earlier. Okay, all right. So, Novo, what's your question? My question was that uh, people doesn't know when people think about jazz, when the jazz word come, comes to their mind. They usually think about something cool, something awesome, but they don't think about history that it came from the African history. So when they're going to the jazz school to learn uh, jazz dance, like what about the teachers that they, they have been taught to? Like, the teachers that they, the teachers, that he's teaching the students the jazz dance. So doesn't he, doesn't he or she knows about the jazz history? Like how will they get the true like original education of the jazz music? It's not their fault that they don't know it. Like no one okay. talks about it. No one talks about the jazz history, jazz dance of history. So when you think about it, it's not actually their fault that they don't know about the history. It's actually that people don't talk about it. 
who doesn't want to talk about it. And when we saw the jazz, uh, your pres like the presentation, I loved it. Uh, and also the thing that when I saw the presentation, I was seeing that the uh, black people were trying to make people understand through the dance. They're trying to show their emotions through the dance and how you're feeling about the history. But the people uh, nowadays, they're showing that they're being competitive. Uh, they're mm -hmm. competing, uh, competing against each other. So, so how are we going to help them? How can we help them like, through schools of jazz dance schools? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is very difficult for sure, especially um, when you look at Calgary where I live, there is a um, specialized jazz dance school with incredible instructors and teachers who actually do know a lot about the history. And that's actually where I've learned a lot of um, the information I shared today is from that school. But when you go into more community-based dance studios, um, smaller dance studios that are in Calgary or in, the, in any area, um, a lot of these teachers actually don't really go through formal training. They don't go through a university program um, where they would gain knowledge like this. Um, and so it really comes down to who, who, who should be able to kind of teach these subjects. Um, because in Canada, when you think if, um, if a teacher, if you want to become a teacher, you go to school and then you get a job. And that's kind of the only way to be able to teach at least in a public school. Um, but that's not the same case if you wanna be a dance teacher. So if you wanted to be a dance teacher, um, you, you literally could just start up your own dance business for your dance studio, offer classes, and then just go right forward with it. You don't have to have any sort of certification or anything like that. So um, there are organizations that are working towards um, teachers having to have a special um, kind of diplomas or certificates um, to prevent this situation and to be able to have informed um, dance teachers being able to teach, um, but it is a slow process. And so this is kind of where the, there's gaps, right? You have studios that are really focused on the competitive side of things and don't value history or teaching, um, teaching history in their dance studios. They only value um, having competitive dance classes and they're marketing their dance classes to families um, in a way that their kids have to take a lot of dance classes to be able to even compete. So they're really focused on the money. It's really money driven um, with these more independent dance studios. Not all, there are a few select that are really, really great at what they do, but it's not enough um, to kind of fill these gaps. So kind of the long-winded answer to your question, I think is just having more qualified dance teachers who are educated. Education is everything. So being educated um, in the history so that they can properly inform their students, whether that be in um, just the regular studies or dance dance classes. So yeah, I hope that answered your question, but all comes so down Maddie, to- So Maddie, would it be fair to say that teaching dance historically is a form of cultural violence, would that be very out of the um, uh, line of thought? No, definitely not. Like, I think it, it definitely fits within this. Um, whether it's kind of unintentional or hasn't been thought about, it's definitely ended up that way where um, people, for instance, um, I've known about people who watch a YouTube video on Bollywood dancing, let's say. They watch a couple of videos and then they go and offer classes saying that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in Bollywood, come take my class. And you would, as a person who's never taken Bollywood, you show up and you're like, okay, this is fun. This seems like what Bollywood is, but really do they have any qualification? Do they know anything about the history of Bollywood or anything like that? So it definitely, I agree. Yes, it's definitely um, culturally, insensitive um, in that way, for sure. Rujda, you have a question. 
Yeah, I I loved your presentation and I knew I would. I was waiting for this day like to, <laughs> since like last week, since we've started talking. So anyway, thank you so much again. I learned a lot. I actually did some swing dance in Quebec when I was awesome. there for an exchange. And it's yeah. it's super hard. It looks easy, it but is. it's not. <laughs> no, it is very challenging. Yeah, so wow. <laughs> And, and you said you do that, right? Because you're a dancer. Yeah, I do. Um, within jazz, I, I don't really specialize in swing, but I have taken a few classes for sure. But it, yeah, it is challenging. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question was actually from um, the cultural point of view. I was yeah. just wondering, like, do, do, it, it can be a little personal too. It's, it's up to you if you want to answer it or not. Totally, I respect that if you don't. But uh, my question is, what made you um was it the dance that you like because you started dancing and then you were aware that you know what this dance is not from my people it's actually from this african uh continent and uh i should respect it because you know originally it is from there or was it because you you maybe you had a friend who was black and they talked about it and you understand it from their point of view too like where did this awareness in you come from that I need to I need to talk about this even though a lot of like you said like the other dance teachers who are doing it for money they're not talking about it but what is that like what drives you to talk about yeah. the history and why do you think it's appropriate to do that for sure yeah thanks that's a great question as well um so I grew up dancing in a dance studio um, that was very heavily focused on Western forms of dance. So ballet, um, mainly, I did mainly ballet. And then um, the jazz dance school that I was talking about earlier, um, I also took a few classes from them. And they were very, they had classes of all sorts. And they had very, very great instructors that knew the history. Um, and they really took pride in having quality instructors. And so I started taking a few classes with them at the same time. And I was noticing kind of the differences I was between, I, I was noticing like my, my instructors at my dance studio would never kind of talk about that. Cause I also took jazz at my dance studio, but it was, it was the more the pop jazz style. And so I was going back and forth these two studios or these, yeah, these two studios, you could call it um, where I was experiencing vernacular jazz and then on the other hand, experiencing pop jazz. And I was really confused. I was like, these are the same thing. What are they? And so then I just started asking questions um, at the place. It's called Decidedly Jazz Dance Works in Calgary. Um, and so I started talking to those instructors um, and getting to know more information. And this was kind of throughout high school, was kind of wondering. And um, so I started to kind of gain a, just a little bit of information on the background of jazz dance while also still um, taking pop jazz dance classes at my jazz, at my, at my regular studio. Um, and then it kind of, I was, it was just kind of circling around throughout high school. And then I got into university and one of my professors, um, Michelle Moss, um, she is very in, involved in jazz dance. And she was actually one of the founders of that jazz dance school, um, decidedly jazz dance. So she, taught all of my jazz classes and again was very well versed in the history and really stressed the importance of understanding the history in these um, classes that I was taking. And so a lot of my knowledge that I've learned today and my awareness, I actually learned from her and through her classes. Um, and so what I really loved about her classes was they weren't just dancing. She would include um, readings you had to do. She would include PowerPoints that we would listen to at the other half of the class. And so we would get that um, that physical dance instruction, but then we would also have the history to tie the two together to understand why are we why are we dancing these um, traditional movements, things like that. So that's kind of where they both connected for me, and then I started to really understand and appreciate the um, the history behind it. And um, it also started to click for me too because all throughout high school, I was also really involved in jazz music in the music program, and so. Um, my band teacher was also incredible at um, giving us kind of facts about history. It was more kind of here and there, it wasn't so concentrated, but um, I, I had that general understanding and he would bring in 
um, professional jazz musicians from New York and would learn from them. And then they would have um, experiences in the history around jazz to share with us as well. So it was just kind of an accumulation um, of information, I guess, through my experiences of participating in the arts and in through music and dance that I've kind of, um, yeah, gained all this knowledge and appreciation for it. So I hope that answered your question. It was kind of all over I the place. I have a little bit to like uh, add to that um, yeah. or ask, I guess, like where you, while you were answering my question, I had another question. Sorry, you know me. <laughs> You've been in the class with me. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, so were those people uh, from Africa, like they were African Americans or were they uh, white people who were actually well versed on the history or were they people actually who came from Africa and they have their ancestors who were maybe uh, connected with the slavery or whatever? Sorry, yes, I should have added that. So my professor, Michelle Moss at the university, um, I believe she's half Jamaican, um, half English, but she was she was born in Canada um, her father's from Jamaica and her mom was from England. So um, she, yes, she does um, definitely have that experience um, as well. Um, and then in terms of my band teacher, um, he was white, but he did bring in a lot of professional jazz musicians who were from New York and they were, they were also black as well. So they, um, not obviously not necessarily from Africa, but they, they had those, those, um, the roots and the connection to it all. So yeah, through that experience, I've also um, had very knowledgeable teachers as well who, who are white and have grown up in Calgary, Alberta, but um, they have applied themselves and are obviously still continuously learning on the topic. Um, but I would consider them to be also mentors in this as well, just because of their education that they've gone through. Um, yeah, so I hope that also answers your question, but yeah. I, I, I was hoping that if um, if if I'm if you and I and Rusta and if you have any so basically uh, we just have finished talking about very elementarily transatlantic you know slavery um, we just have started talking about that how incredibly important for uh, our students to learn. Um, that's where we started. <laughs> That's where we started. So one of the things uh, that I want to add here mm -hmm. is, so you and I, I, I mean, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. I know these students will ask six months down the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they will ask a question, these questions, which they're not asking, uh, which I know from, because we both have similar cultural, I mean, um, the students and I come from similar areas, similar socioeconomic background uh, and, and, and what have you. Yes. One of the things that, you know, what you said that learning about jazz history is incredibly important, but it happened to you almost like not in a very systematic, you know, structural way you came to know from here and there. So in the yeah. areas of research, I'm saying this fancy word to uh, all the students is that the word is epistemic violence, that when knowledge is used to cause violence, the production yeah. and dissemination of knowledge. So the politics of what gets to, what gets to syllabus, the politics of which history to be taught. Like for instance, I'm sure that you completing high school in Canada, you know very well that in your high school, you are not very actively taught the history of indigenous, you know, the colonial cruelty. You actively have not been taught the history of slavery. You actively have not been taught that Canada's attitude towards South Asian people in 1914, when the ship came to you know, British Columbia, you know, during the First World War, the British Columbia, the parliament had to be convened, you know, and, and the thing is, mind you, that we have been a British colony for over 200 years. We have fought for the Brits. We have died for the Brits. We have fallen for the Brits. But when we came to the shores of Canada, on a, you know, very bluntly, they did not want to accept us. Just three weeks ago, a Muslim family was brutally murdered. What was their crime? Well, they were Muslims, right? You know, so all of that. So 
I want to say it unapologetically, and I know that, I hope that you understand that I may sound at time intense or coming from a place of pain, but you understand that, you know, how that trauma exists when you understand your history. And I, yeah. one of the terms that I have taught this students already is that the expression is a historical, is that getting to know something as if they don't have a history is a form of violence. It's a form of psychic colonization. It's a form of, like I often tell them that Einstein wouldn't have gotten a Nobel Prize had it not been similarly the contribution of a Bengali mathematician. We know about Einstein, but we don't know about that you know, scientist. We don't know that it was the Bengali mathematician's work based on whose work. Five white scientists have gotten Nobel Prize. We, we, we don't know that. So I want to add to that, that you know, what you do not know, it's not an, you know, it's an accidental thing. It's very strategic and structural and built in it uh, to invisibilize history. That's one. You have talked about something incredibly important that the history of jazz and how, and I want to add the Bengali poem that you all know uh, um, and I'm going to translate uh, for Maddie in a bit. Um, so I want to add that the history of jazz and how it is built in it. Um, and I want to add the history of jazz and how it is built in it. And I want to add the history of jazz and how it is built in it. And I want to add the history of jazz and how it is built in it. And I want to add the history of jazz and how it is built in it. And I want to add the history of jazz. আমাদের ফসল ব্রিটিশরা জোর করে এসে নিয়ে যাচ্ছে আমাদেরকে ধান চাষ করতে দিচ্ছে না আমরা না খেয়ে মারা যাচ্ছি আমাদেরকে নীল চাষ করতে বাধ্য করছে এই কথাগুলো কিন্তু বলতে পারতাম না এই জন্য কবিরা কি করেছেন তাদের কবিতার মধ্যে এই সেমান্টিক কোডিং করে গেছেন যে বুলবুলিতে ধান খেয়েছে বুলবুলিতে ধান খাবে কেন পাখি ধান খেলে কি খাজনা দেওয়ার কোনো পথ থাকে না যাতে করে বলা যায় সো ম্যাডি হোয়াট আই জাস্ট স্যাড that there is a poem written during the British colonial, uh, British in India, is that where mm -hmm. the poem goes like this, is that, you know, I can't pay taxes because the birds have eaten all the rice, all the paddy. So basically at that time, if the farmers would say that, well, the Brits are coming and taking all our rice, the Brits are compelling us to uh, produce indigo, not rice, because they want to sell indigo, the uh, British colonial cruel rule would be brutal. And I have already talked with, you know, with our students is that the British colonial rule was so cruel that they did not even spare a child from hanging because that child resisted. And this is why you from Canada and these kids from Bangladesh together can collaborate to know your history together is that how the oppressor and the oppressed, the history will not spare you if you do not go back to the root to understand that how the knowledge-based violence continues to happen. In Bangladesh today, we learn that Columbus was a discoverer. He was a hero. That's what I grew up studying. If you ask most kids in Bangladesh, they'll continue learning it. My master's research, graduate research in Canada was epistemic violence. I question the literacy practice in Bangladesh, both in Bengali medium and English medium, the history that we teach continues to be colonial. Because in 1834, the British Viceroy of India gave a very notable speech in British Parliament where he said, mind you that 30,000 British officers were controlling three, controlling and brutalizing cruelly 300 million brown people. So they needed to create a group of collaborators. Like, you know, just, you know, a couple of weeks ago when the remains of 215 indigenous children's bodies were found in a in a British Columbia school and we are shocked. Mm -hmm. So when in Canada, Justice Sinclair said that this is a cultural genocide, we need to understand what happened in Canada, what happened in America and what happened in Bangladesh, they are connected. And that is why we start our discussion with MAP. We start our discussions that why this part of the world is considered to be first world. When I, teach, when I work, whether it is as a teaching assistant or as a session instructor, I tell my students that I want you to know my name clearly. 
like mm. just how in the Black Lives Matter movement, we hear, again, I'm not comparing at all. I am not comparing at all. One of the yeah. things that we hear is that, say her name, say his name, say the name who have been brutally murdered, say the names of indigenous women who continues to be murdered and they go on missing. I know I'm using a lot of academic language, which all of these students do not understand yet, but this is a recorded class. And that's what I'm saying to you is that six months, one year down the road, when they will remember their friend Maddie came and presented, mm -hmm. they will understand at that time a lot more than what they understand right now. But I often say is that when you hear somebody speak English and you automatically you know, feel inferior because you can't speak English like them. When millions of immigrants in Canada and America, we suffer you know, the systemic violence, symbolic violence, because we speak English idiosyncratically, which is not Canadian enough, which is not American enough, which is not British enough. When from Bangladesh, we come and speak English here, we have an accent, but my friend, if somebody comes from France and speak English, that is really attractive and sexy, that is exotic. But when we speak English, that is Desi. So there are violence underneath this apparently naive interpretation of social interaction and your interest in cultural anthropology, your interest in dance, perhaps will take you down that rabbit hole. Perhaps sometimes it will exist in your mind like a splinter that will not let you sleep at night, that you will go through uh, torment, intellectual, philosophical, existential, will probably send you through depression. <laughs> but I invite you, Maddie, if you mm. stick to the path, if you stick yeah. to be unapologetically courageous and stick to you know, the path with discomfort, with the unknown, I tell you that you will go through transformation that my words cannot possibly you know, explain. So the idea of jazz being performed in North America, like when you hear Billie Halliday, the strange fruit yeah. I don't think that my eyes would get wet or I sometimes break in tears in uncontrollably if I did not know the history of you know, slavery. Yeah. But they, when I listen to Billie Halliday without knowing the history, mm -hmm. when I hear the song of Adam and Devil, you know, you know, there's a famous music composition, this white musician and this black musician that together go in a journey. It's yeah. crazy. There's a documentary on that in Netflix. Um, it will, it will take you down the rabbit hole. But at the same time, I often quote Orun Thuti Roy, a very notable Indian author who says, never to worship power, but always to love courage. Mm. Never to look away from the ugly, despicable brutality that happens because of my own comfort. Oh, I don't want to know that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know that. I have heard discussions working as a you know graduate teaching assistant or as an instructor is that, oh, we don't want to teach our white undergraduate students, the brutal murder of Rina Virk in British Columbia, because these kids are only in their undergraduate first year and second year, their mind is too fragile. And who are saying this? Mostly white professors. And mind you, at that time I was an international student, my immigration was not done. But you see, I write in pain. And now, now that I am I have completed my immigration here. Now, now that I don't have to worry about my visa, that I'll have to go back. <laughs> I say these things unapologetically. I make this my political journey and I say, knowledge is fundamentally political. So with that rant and my, you know, you can hear the agony in my interpretation, in my uh, narrative. Do you think in Canadian context and in American context, when somebody knows ballet, you know, that proper elite posture and form and, you know, um, oh, uh, Jennifer has gone to ballet and she has earned that award. But yeah. when you listen to Tupac, when you listen to Kendrick Lamar, when yeah. Kendrick Lamar is singing, saying how much a dollar really cost, right? Mm -hmm. 
and he's swearing. He's not, he's not fearing to drop the F bomb. Mm -hmm. That's where the white privileged protected upper class can say, oh, that's too inappropriate. Oh, that's the black angry woman who is always black, you know, angry, right? But delegitimizing the experiences they live, right? You okay. as an aspiring dancer and you as an aspiring anthropologist, what do you think about it? Is that understanding which culture gets ghettoized, which culture gets a particular label and which culture gets the label of being elite? Right. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, well, I believe like labels just create division in my opinion, in some cases, obviously. Um, and as a white person, yeah, I, I definitely see that happening. Uh, I mean, it's definitely very apparent in the dance world for sure. Um, if I'm speaking in a dance context for, per se, um, even jazz dance compared to contemporary dance because contemporary dance is a whole other genre as well of, of dance. Um, you can see the systematic difference as well in let's say my even my university program and if you look at dance university programs across Canada a lot of them are contemporary based and that is the focus whereas jazz dance for me I can't major in jazz dance I can only major in contemporary dance and so that's what I'm doing um, but jazz dance for me is only an option I only can I only can take four classes in my whole degree in jazz dance Whereas my contemporary classes, I take a class every single semester for four years. And so I tried looking for a university that offered Bachelor of Fine Arts in jazz dance in Canada, because that's where I, I wanted to stay. Um, and there's just no offerings in that, which is that is just it's like the, it's the system that's set up, right? It's how do we break that system? How do we incorporate and level out these playing fields here so that one isn't better than the other and they're both valid um and yeah i'm not not saying you shouldn't be able to major in ballet or contemporary but it's these forms that have been historically beaten down or not respected or have been discriminated against such as jazz dance or hip-hop there's nowhere you can get a degree in hip-hop i don't haven't heard of a place that you can get a degree in hip-hop so for me a lot of my focus and my train of thought recently has been what are we offering in our education programs? Um, I actually wrote a paper last semester on where is our indigenous education on dance? Um, I only once in my degree so far had a conversation in a class that lasted probably around 20 minutes around indigenous dance. And there, my prof couldn't really speak on it because there wasn't really, like they weren't qualified. Um, and yeah, there was just no awareness. I was, and I mean, indigenous dance is different in the fact that yes, you definitely can easily appropriate it if not done the right, correct way. But I feel that that has been a barrier and an excuse to not incorporate it in, um, into mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. education systems. And so that has been on my forefront of thinking about anthropo anthropology, culture, dance is our program offerings. Because if you want to, be qualified as a dance teacher, you have to, well, you don't have to, but if you personally want to be qualified enough to feel um, that you can teach properly with the history and knowledge that you should have as a dance teacher, you want to go to a university. And so that's why I chose to do that. But when you look at the program offerings, there's it's really slim pickings if you want to stay within Canada. I mean, in the US, I can't really speak much to it. I'm sure there's, I've heard of more specialized jazz programs. But even those ones aren't necessarily truly built on authentic history either. A lot of it is commercialized in Broadway and you can do a ton of different conservatory diploma programs in Broadway and commercialized dance. Um, but if you're looking for more of a kind of authentic um, scholarly kind of experience in a, in a dance form other than ballet or contemporary or modern dance, it's very difficult to find a program. So one of my kind of 
thoughts, kind of aspirations for right now is to be able to create um, kind of a multicultural dance program or something where each dance style stands on its own and you can take a degree in that dance style because it's just nowhere to be found. And so when, in my paper, I discussed, um, I actually researched how many different public schools even incorporate Indigenous dance, Canadian Indigenous dance into their curriculum. And it's literally nowhere to be found. There's a couple places where they mention um, powwows or something like that, which is a type of dance that Indigenous people practice in Canada. But there's no really program for it. There's no education on it. And it's really unfortunate because that is the dance of Canada. Is the, it's literally Canada's dance and nobody, nobody knows about it. So that's really what kind of gets me going, I guess, and talking about this. Um, and I've been in, talking with some of my professors about this. Um, but when I presented my paper last semester, it was and it was in front of the whole faculty and everything, I really didn't get much response to it, which was interesting as well. Um, I got more of a response from my mentor who is um, half Jamaican and then the rest of the faculty is white. So there you go. So <laughs> that's kind of what I've experienced so far. And that's where I want to head as someone who does have privilege um, in maybe being able to get these topics going and incorporating more diverse people into the conversation to get these topics out there. Um, but yeah, that's been my experience so far and my interests. Um, mm -hmm. I really wish I was doing a degree in jazz dance, but <laughs> yeah, that, that'll have to come, right? So yeah. yeah. And, and, and also if you, if you think about it is that if Rushta or let's say Cynthia or any of these uh, students here. Rushda is now uh, uh, obviously like me. She's also an immigrant and she has the rights like I do. Uh, yeah. But if any of the students, international students, if they come here, so you can call it, it's a kind of knowledge invisibilization. Is that how one knowledge? It's not the case that there are no indigenous dancers, but if you are to welcome the indigenous dancer at the universities, you will have to change the structure. And if the structure needs to be changed means the structure that has been serving the interest of white people for the past, you know, 600 years, you don't want that. You don't want that. And there, one of the other danger is that when you go into that space, you better know your battle. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you see, uh, Maddie, dare I say, you will, you can go to some places because you're a white woman, you can ask a stark question, difficult question, and probably come out of that unscathed. Yeah. It might not be the same experience if it is no. done by somebody else. I think uh, Naim has a question. Uh, I have this very short question for Maddie. Uh, like, as you mentioned, jazz uh, basically came from the vernacular jazz, uh, mm -hmm. which which uh, emerged like in the early 90s, I guess, 1900s. So I want to know about the timeline. And you also explained about the pop dance, like pop jazz. So basically during uh, or before the Second World War, uh, I think, Jazz was influenced by ballet and other 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 classical techniques of modern dance and other things. So, when was this uh, pop uh, or pop jazz or uh, commercial jazz or commercially, uh, uh, you know, the selling jazz yeah. that you are mentioning uh, started and uh, you know uh, took uh, came out as as a mainstream jazz form. Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't know if numbers are super correct, but um, from re remembering from one of my dance lectures in the 90s, there was a whole movement um, of being kind of called a flexible dancer and not in the sense that you're like flexible physically, but that you are able to cater to multiple different styles. Um, of dance. So not only do you know jazz, jazz dance, but you know ballet, you know um, modern. And this was to cater to kind of, 
capitalism, if you want to say, like the selling of dance and having, if you are a choreographer or a director, who are you going to hire? The person that can do six different styles of dance or a person that can do one? And so within this kind of period of time in the 90s where um, people were seeking out dancers to be able to cater to multiple different styles, um, pop jazz kind of came out of that and was kind of catering to more of the showy entertainment style of performance. Um, you know, at like award shows or um, let's say, I don't know, like in New York, you know how they have um, just different shows that they put on, like for entertainment purposes, for people to come buy the tickets to come see you perform. So not only was it on a level of choreographers um, seeking out dancers who are able to do multiple different styles, it's like the public that are wanting to see this style of dance, this popular style of dance. So pop, like pop jazz as in popular. Um, so they want to see this hybrid of jazz dance and make it showy. And so when you when we watched the pop jazz video, it was very much like structured lines, very showy, very kind of competitive. And that was what was appealing and still kind of is to this day when you watch an award show online or something, it's, it's, it's a show, you're there to be entertained. Um, and so I think that's kind of where pop jazz has morphed into a little bit um, and being able to take those movements from authentic jazz, vernacular jazz and apply them to what they need right now for profit. Um, so that's kind of my general understanding of it right now from what I've learned in my lectures and things like that. Um, but I think it, it really morphed to be able to serve the people and please the people. If that makes sense. I, I also want to add here that one of the things that we need to be incredibly uh, mindful that has pretty much happened to any. So if you think about the history of jazz or blues, they're not mm. just music. They were the art for resistance. Yeah. These form of art grew out of social movement. When you hear blues, you can understand that what does it mean to be a black person in America? When you mm -hmm. hear Nina Simone, I mean, if you listen to her, if you listen to her, you will understand that pain. You will understand that, oh, what must have possibly happened? But whenever any form of art that becomes a potential tool for resistance. Think about the whole idea of rap music. It was born out of the fact that rappers were using their language, quote unquote, their form of language to express their forms of oppression. But now over the years, if you see the capitalistic co-option, or I say, commodification, I know these words they will learn pretty soon, that commodification of that art, that the potential to resist dies down. Mm -hmm. It, that, that potential energy, that edginess, that sharpness that can act, what happens that it, it, it takes out that potence out of that. And once that potence is taken out of that, it remains as a hollow shell that fakely and unfairly, and again, that's why I see knowledge-based violence, that's, oh, this is, you know, black music, or this is music from Latin America, but the version that brings money, but the version that actually gives up the original purpose, why it is started blues, jazz, these forms of music were social movement. They were not just music. You know, when you hear the song that brothers, you will not, you will not, you know, revolution will not be televised. It's just not a song. It is not just a song. When Eric Garner was brutally murdered, when the song came out, I can't breathe, it's not just a song, it's documenting history. When Emmett Till was murdered, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, why? Why did that happen? But then very soon that potence, because art has the capacity to evoke emotion out of you and that brings social transformation. And that's where Maddie, I think 
you know, your commitment, your intellectual integrity, your commitment to, you know, do whatever you can to uphold the value of this art. And like I said, is that, you know, I mean, a lot of white women have played a lot of important roles being a really badass ally. <laughs> they have, you know, they have. At least, mm -hmm. you know, a white woman cannot be so easily be dispensable like the way it can be when it is a black woman or, you know, an indigenous woman or, you know, people of color. But that doesn't mean that, you know, white women do not bear the brunt of capitalist, patriarchal, toxic, you know, structure. Now, this is where I say, uh, remember, Ruth, we often say the word interconnectedness. Our discussion started with jazz. But now you see it's connected to history, politics, economy, technology, you know, um, how things are run. You know, when Maddie is saying, if you go to YouTube, see which videos are popular. If you see this, you know, show, see, see, these are connected. These are connected. Go on, Rizda, I think you had, you had a question. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to add to something that you were saying. You were talking about uh, how certain artists, uh, especially like rappers, and uh, I, I, well, I still am a little bit less now, but I, I used to be a huge Eminem fan. I don't know how many people here listen to Eminem, but <laughs> I just living in Bangladesh, I didn't understand the life in America, right? He was from Detroit and there as a white kid, as a white person growing up in a black neighborhood, he literally, like he was that odd one who didn't live a white life, you know, like everyone else, like all, all of his friends, like where like the the whole D12 uh, band, if you guys know, like Dr. Dre and everyone, their friends, like you will see Eminem has like all black friends. And he was like the odd white kid who was also living in that um, trailer park or slum or whatever area, like very, very like poverty ridden and, and you know, all that. And then in his songs, like, he actually says like that's why I, I I honestly I'm so proud of like University of Calgary Arts Department for having Eminem's biography on the display like I was so happy because like in his songs he talks about you know like oh all the cool all, all the all the kids think all the white kids think that I'm so cool like I, I talk about pistol I talk about uh, you know martyrs and everything and they think it that she, okay I'm just gonna say his words I'm sorry for swearing they, th they think this shit's cool, but you know, you hold a pistol and it can teach you hate. And like, he talks about all these things. So you can, you can tell that he's protesting. He's saying that, guys, wake up. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that just because I'm, I'm holding a gun, it's not because it's cool. That's what they're, the marketer is making it to be. He can't say that because his, his, he has this like, um, I wouldn't say a blindfold, but for his mouth, like it's shut, right? He he has a certain label and he's under a certain authority. He can't say everything on the radio. And he says, like, if you listen to Eminem, he, he would say that, yeah, like uh, they don't let me go on radios anymore. They don't let me talk on TV shows anymore. There's a reason because he's always protesting about like how bad the system is in America. And there's actually a song called White America where he talks about how there's like white privileges and they have like certain, you know, like racism or classism and all these things. And, and, and anyone, like just any hip hop artist or like rappers, if you listen to it closely, instead of trying to be all cool and all these things, like when we, when, when um, Furrow said that um, there, like there, there's another, uh, whoever's trying to control this like capitalism kings, if you will, or whoever's behind this, the untouchables or the Illuminati or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they're trying to make it a cool thing or like it's for showbiz like it's it's a performance it's not real don't pay attention they're like distracting you with all these things whereas the artists themselves are trying to like wake people up they're like hey look what's happening in my town my mom was so poor that we had to have pills for breakfast breakfast or dinner she didn't have money to buy food and those are the things that he's talking about but on the tv they're saying yeah he talks about drugs and pills and 
you know, just just making him look bad. Same with Michael Jackson. Like he tried to warn everyone how much racism there was. Like if you listen to the song, they don't care about us. All I want to say that they don't really care about us. Like he tries to put energy and all these things to make people listen to him. He tries to put whatever he can, but all of his songs are talking about protest, about the earth, about capitalism, about racism. So yeah, sorry, I got emotional here, but yeah, it's very dear to me. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. You're just muted. You're still. muted. You have to unmute. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. So I just did a mistake when I said that the documentary on the uh, Netflix, uh, the collaboration between a white musician and a black musician is called Adam and Satan. Uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant documentary where, you know, when you listen to their band, I mean, this, this guy, this, 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 this white guy, he's actually an English professor. He drops his Ivy League graduation degrees and everything he <laughs> goes to, lives with, you know, goes to the uh, black part of the uh, uh, New York and listens to the song and, and tries to understand, tries to understand. And, and it's, it's very, it's, it's very tough. And then also, if you listen to MIA, the Sri Lankan British musician, Matangi, is that when you listen to the song, Paper Plane, you know, when you listen to the song, you know, uh, when she's protesting, uh, the world policy towards refugee. And, and I, I have made list for this class, you know, uh, songs is that, where do you think this song came from? When you listen to Pink Floyd's song, we don't need no, you know, education, you know, that's where you learn the politics of education, right? Um, so Maddie, once again, I really want to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And I hope that, you know, you enjoyed it and you know you have probably you know Rushta and I went on a rant but you understand that where we come from <laughs> yeah oh definitely it's been a pleasure it's been so great listening to all different perspectives and everything I've learned a lot myself so <laughs> thank you for having me and 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 we look forward to you joining us whenever time permits you uh, yeah, so and and anytime whenever you can uh, so this is the time when we meet we meet around like you know um uh, your time in Alberta right now, it's, I think, eight o'clock right now? Oh, yeah, it's almost 10 to nine, yeah. Okay, okay, so uh, around, around nine, exactly. So uh, do you folks have any question for Maddie uh, before uh, we wrap up? Okay. Awesome, well, thank you again. Uh, Maddie, thank you very much for joining us and uh, um, I we look forward to you know, have you as 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 often as you can you know to in our class and discuss and you know learn from each other, and yeah. uh, everybody you know this recording is going to be in our you know group, and once I download from Zoom server I'm going to upload it, and I know that I've said a lot of things that you won't you won't understand it now but you'll understand down the road. <laughs> I mean Rusda is shaking her head because uh, well Rusda understands. <laughs> There's that. I mean, please conclude the class and then you know, we'll stop recording. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mehdi. Like, I can't thank you enough for joining us because this class, uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm going to be a fangirl because I am of this school and I've been, I don't know how long we've been talking about this school for. <laughs> so yeah thank you so much this this class gives me a lot of spiritual wealth and you probably know what that means and you can see like how we talk about social issues just openly like this with anyone and everyone and they're just thinkers from everywhere in the world like today it's you maybe another day it's another person from india and and we did have uh dr sangeeta rai from india right mm -hmm. so like every time like if you join us another day you will see different people like even more like scholars or, or other people just sharing their view of the world and 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 like i love this school so much because like at the end of the day uh, uh, at the end of the day we're all humans and and mm -hmm. that's what that's what it's about it's about the oneness because there's so much discrimination between like different groups because we let ourselves have different identities other than human beings. We are Muslims, 
we are indigenous, we're white, we're black, like all these things. But at the end of the day, we all come down to one, you know, just humans mm -hmm. and nature. And, 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 and when I do this class, it's so wholesome. Like, like Furrow said just now, he said that interconnectedness, right? Like how everything connects at the end and we see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but like, it feels, it, it just fills my heart with like, spiritual wealth because like I'm like oh my god like I can see so many different perspectives at the same time and you don't think like that because you're just you and you're limited in your in your sphere right you can't go out of your horizon of knowledge and get other perspectives that's why I love love this school and I'm so happy that you you were here and you put so much effort yeah, guys, please thank Maddie because like she's been I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the back backstory of it. So we've been talking for like a week now about this whole presentation and she was so excited and she was nervous and she's like, oh, my God, do, do, do I like do I have to um, a, a little bit more background because the, we were in this class where we were taught like anthropology, cultural anthropology, where we talked about different cultures, right? And we talk about how in different cultures, different things are like the same thing can be like disrespectful in another culture. And Maddie being such a nice person, she was like asking me, she's like, should I have any consideration before I come to your class? Cause I'm not like, I really wanna be, I really wanna make sure I'm respectful to all the people in the class. And and that means a lot. And And I feel like, that is the objective of this class, you know, bringing us together, like caring about each other and, and thinking about these things that we don't usually. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, with that positive note and vibe, I wish you in Bangladesh, have you have a wonderful day. And in Canada, Rushda and Maddie, you have a wonderful night, you know, uh, you. stay safe, take care. I mean, uh, I got my second shot of vaccine today and I'm not feeling <laughs> very well but yeah. you know I was very I was yeah. very happy you know uh seeing you uh here and you know seeing and uh, as I, I say this to Rujda all the time that you participate an hour and two here you will be pumped <laughs> for a long time so this yeah. is the fuel that you get so have a wonderful evening everybody you know bye-bye thank you bye, bye. bye. Thank you. bye.